black girl magic means to me black and African women using their ancestral knowledge, often inherited through trauma or dislocation, but not always. Using that strength, using that knowledge, that access to elevate themselves and elevate their lives and by default everyone around them because magic has rippling effects. You just heard Phoenix talking about her concept of black girl magic. I, of course, can make no claims to black girl magic. I am white. I recognize that there are places and spaces that aren't for me and my exclusion isn't mean-spirited. It's about healing. It's reparative in nature. Safe places where I don't belong. I understand that and I support that. I don't feel that same necessity of exclusion for me when it comes to voodoo, and again for me more specifically Santeria, because I was called to meet Shango, Chango, Sango, and Yamaya, and I heard their message, and I lived it. I'll try to tell this story as quickly as possible because I really want to get back to part two of my conversation with Phoenix, so here we go. When I was in my early 20s, I had a trauma that I'll characterize as a violent betrayal. And when it happened, somehow all that I knew was that I had to get as far away as possible and I had to go by myself. Now, I was working at a gas station at the time, so I didn't have a lot of money, and it took me a few months to scrimp and save. But after a few months of penny pinching and austerity, I was on a plane to Cuba. My plane landed. I went to my hotel and slept for 14 hours. I woke up in Havana with no real plans. I had arranged to spend a couple days there before taking a bus to the beach for the rest of my stay. I'm not a resort person by nature, but I was in recovery, and part of that message that I kept getting in my head was that I had to go and stare at the ocean. Flash forward 12 hours or so later, and I'm in a room with a dirt floor, concrete walls, a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling, and a luxurious buffet set up against one wall. The centerpiece was a plastic saint, kind of like you would imagine someone having on their lawn at Christmas. And the room starts to fill, and drums are being beaten. Metal and hide banging and banging, and the crowd is filling up the room, and the sound is filling up the room. And a priest and a priestess enter, dressed all in red from their heads to their toes. And I know that something incredible is about to happen. And so the priest and priestess go around the room, and when it's my turn, the priestess squirted something into my hands and then rubbed her hands together to sort of pantomime what I was to do. And then she grabbed me by the shoulders and spun me and spun me and spun me until I was dizzy and then flung me out into the crowd. Then she disappeared. And when she returned, she had a chicken, a live chicken. She was pulling the feathers off and throwing them into the air and scattering them into the crowd. And then she the chicken's head was removed from its body, and I thought to myself, oh my god, that is the most intense and incredible thing I will ever see. And then they brought out the goat, and they paraded around the house, chanting, blessing it, and it was in front of me, and I looked into its eyes, and then I saw the inside of its neck. And I wasn't afraid, and I still didn't ask any questions, but I knew that I had been a part of something sacred and holy and profound and powerful. I was told the party would go on for three more days, but I lasted about six hours. I was lovingly put into a taxi by my new friends, went back to my hotel, and got up the next morning to head to the ocean, where, as I had planned, I sat and stared into her. And on my last day in Cuba, having arrived with no idea what I was doing or where I was going, where my life was headed or who my friends were, on my last day in Cuba, I woke up and I knew what I had to do. I had to move from southern Ontario to Montreal and I had to do a lit degree. 
Again, this is 2001 by 2002. That's what I was doing. I went to Cuba looking for answers, and I got them. And I know from whom I got those answers. In the years that have passed, I've had a chance to do a little bit more research, and I discovered that the saint, the plastic saint, on that buffet was St. Barbara, who is a stand-in for Shango, sometimes Chango, sometimes Sango. And the more I learned about this Orisha, the more I learned about Shango, the more I knew that this connection was real. Ayelisa Akulatande, we referenced her book in the Primary Missing Witches podcast about Mama Lola. Again, please read this book if you have any interest in Ifa or Yoruba at all. It's fantastic. Akalatunde says, Sango is the force of strength and perseverance that causes man to strive for correctness and righteousness. He is the power of truth and the support that the universe lends to those who are truthful. So I personally give it up to Shango on the daily. All of that anger I had for those friends who had betrayed me with violence and lies has turned to gratitude. And again, I feel I have Shango to thank. I'll also add that Shango sometimes goes by St. Jerome, which is a big town about halfway between me and Reese's homes. So again, I give it up to Shango on the daily for calling me to Cuba to be cleansed and blessed and guided. And now part two of my interview with Phoenix. I will start with the dreaded T word trauma uh, and I will just generalize patriarchal trauma mm -hmm. and then I will talk about how I overcame that Good, because that's <laughs> always ladies and gentlemen who are listening that's always how I mean we can't deny that a lot of these stories these people's magic shows up after a traumatic event and oftentimes in our own lives it takes a trauma to force us to evolve, to force us out of our comfort. And I'm not recommending trauma, mm. and I'm definitely <laughs> not saying you seek it, but this is a theme that we see over and over and over again, especially with witches. Oh my god, I cannot talk about overcoming patriarchal trauma without talking about inspirational women. Um, so let me talk about the first inspiring woman, who I've only recently come to recognize fully as an inspiring woman, my mother. Oh, wonderful. She is very flawed and very hurt by patriarchy, and having a relationship with that is confronting my pain with patriarchy, and it's doubly traumatizing, but it's the most necessary work, and I have healed so much ancestral trauma intergenerational fucking trauma you've burned by, the karma of your ancestors but i mean it's still there but i'm <laughs> definitely engaging with it and my mom is i'm privileged to have like i said a good enough relationship with her we are really trying she is seeing me she's seeing my pain and she understands and recognizes it and that's amazing so that's my mom and then that's the first goddess she's such of. a witch yeah <laughs> she's such a house witch she just makes everything beautiful and she's teaching me how to love my house as part of loving myself because i've flown away from both then my second i'll say feminist role model witch role model goddess role model miss naylor she was my drama teacher and she like was first my literature teacher and i love that shit i'm like i just eat up languages and literature and culture and arts like it's just and she saw it and she pushed me and I got into it and she worked with my drama and I became the powerhouse that I am and the feminist power. She was my first kind of recognized feminist. She was a white woman. So I first recognized feminist role model um, before I could accept my mother. Can you just shout out her name one more time? For Marie that? Naylor for Marie everyone. Marie Naylor. Thank yeah. you so much. Carry on. She was one of those drama teachers who everyone with all the kids with problems would go to and like just hang out and do drama. And she was amazing beautiful beautiful individual and then um when i grew up and went to i immigrated to canada and like discovered all these things and kind of had like a second childhood which was very messy in adulthood and i did like lots of drugs and lots of sex anyway i ended up doing a thing where i um applied for like a dominatrix job i'd never done it before but i knew that i could i was like i'm such a great performer like i'll be fine and i talked to a woman on the phone who ran the Montreal Doms um, 
it was a thing at the time. It's over now. Um, and she interviewed me, and one of her questions for if you were a goddess, which goddess would, would you be? What? And it was the first question. Nobody had ever asked me that before. And I was so stoked. And I just, like, got – that's when I got into Isis, and that's when I, like, really connected with the goddess. Can you shout out this person's name again, too, please? I'm not sure I want to out her. Um, okay. Then no problem. Just beautiful goddess that you are. We thank you for that she question. She was cool. Because I want you to ask our listeners – if you were a goddess... If you were a goddess, what, who would you be? Okay, so we're going to give you one second to ask yourself about that. Okay, now carry on. And she used to, like, make doming so good and so fun. She mentored me. She taught me how to do all this stuff and, like, cock and ball torture. And this is how you do the condom thing. This is how you don't touch her. And you don't, like, this is how you, you talk and all this stuff. And she used to bake cookies. And she would make sure I would always eat. And she was like... Always the house was so clean, and she would paint stuff on the floors. She was really cool. She was like a great introduction into domination, which a lot of people don't have, and I'm very privileged to have had that experience of sex work. So thank you. Shout out to this person who I will not name <laughs> for safety reasons. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> so that's goddess number two. Yes. Three. Three. We had your mom, we had your teacher, then we had your second teacher. Yes, exactly. And honestly, like, Women are magic. Feminine energy, regardless of sex and gender, is magic. Feminized labor is magic. Uh, things that are, like, shunned and, like, excluded because of their femininity are magic. Sex work is goddamn magic. Get into that, please. Okay. Sex work. The responsibility of someone's well-being and pleasure, right? You're, you're saying it's a transactional thing. You're giving me cash that I deserve because this is a very hard labor. And I will be trusted, well, in theory, in like the ideal. I will be trusted, especially in kink, in BDSM circles. I will be trusted with the responsibility of giving you this experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a hard thing. You have to know a person quickly, understand their limits and their desires, um, create something like kind of in a dynamic way, which causes you to be so present and open um it's it's very magical i really flexed when i was a dom i was really good at what i did i love to do it i love to get into like that mode and i like hmm the power of it the power of it you know at the time i was a very abused girl um confronting very gendered realities in my body i also have beauty privilege so i got a lot of attention from men and, and i that's why i monetize it it makes total sense anyway so just to interrupt um she's not kidding beauty privilege <laughs> she's gorgeous i mean i know you can't see her but we'll, we'll post a picture on our instagram so you know what we're dealing with here. thank you so beauty privilege yeah you made use of it and um, and sex work especially domination work really healed a lot of my sexual trauma and my patriarchal trauma because it gave me an access to a sense of power that was created consensually that made it so that my desire was supreme and that was so intoxicatingly educating because in a way it was absolutely true and it changed who I was as a person. I became a person who believed, sorry, I don't know why I'm talking at the screen, but I became a person who believed in myself and in my own sexual power and in my own right to pleasure and, and yeah, like that I come first and that I, what I want is law and like that fucking healed me because that was absolutely antithesis to the experiences that I had been having uh -huh. because I was sexually uneducated in Kuwait when I grew up. And coming to Canada, I caught up real fast and uh, didn't do everything right, you know? And so I, I, I took in a lot of shit. And so monetizing it and then getting into a power mode where I was like in a fantasy power mode that became reality for me. Like I totally am a powerhouse now and I believe it. I'm fully a goddess. Like I'm fully activated as a goddess in this life. I'm a very flawed goddess who is still ascending and trying to access, you know, like I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm a goddess in infancy, but I'm nonetheless a beast. Like, really, I'm just an amazing individual because I fucking try, and that's all you need to do. Well, that's all you can do. 
if you I mean, if you're just try. trying and failing and trying and failing and trying, then you're a fucking hero. Exactly. Thank you for yeah. existing and surviving. Yeah. As like, long as you're not trying to be an asshole. I mean, let's draw the line somewhere. Don't yeah. try to be an asshole. No, you're and, and if you're failing at being an asshole though, I guess that's great. So yeah. And and honestly that's that's a very important point too. Confronting the asshole in you is all of the work. Ooh, yes. yes, this is where I'm at right now. Is being like, oh shit, you're fucked up. Mm-hmm. But um, make no <laughs> mistake. Like maybe you're at home and you're sitting there going, okay, Phoenix is like talking about how she's an amazing goddess, and then she's also sitting there talking about how fucked up she is and flawed and makes mistakes. And how do those? So let us tell you, me, Amy, and she, Phoenix. Let us tell you, there is no difference between being amazing and being flawed absolutely there is strength in vulnerability let me tell you this right now admitting your faults is the toughest most courageous thing you can do and that's why most people don't do it yeah that's why most people are guided by their egos because they're so terrified that you're gonna find out that they're not perfect but the joke's on them we already knew yeah (laughs) Because none of us are. So get into it. Be imperfect. Like, I've seen people visibly relax around me when I, you know, admit one of my own flaws. Yeah. Or, you know, oh, yeah, I've made hundreds of mistakes. And their bodies physically relax. Wow. Like, it's okay. Magical. You know? And so don't get it twisted. We, we at this point, we're recording this before, but at this point you will have heard the Ipsita Roy Chakraverti episode where she talks about the arrogant woman and how all women need to be arrogant and there is nothing that should be stopping you from talking about yourself in the exact same way that Phoenix talks about herself. She is a goddess and she knows it. And this is what we should all aspire to be. <laughs> so back to the goddess, you are her and you're in progress. Yeah, so that's where it began. And then after that, I just have many other witches in my life that I have to give credit to, like Tanya Slavovich. She's a wrestler, feminist, sci-fi, queer wrestler with Earthbound. And she's just always taught me how to like speak my truth and hold my ground and say what I'm feeling, which is like such a magical thing. It's a very hard magical thing, and I'm grasping. But she also taught me like actual like tarot and like different like influences that you know she picked up and and she's a person who doesn't read and totally is intuitive she's a totally intuitive witch she does her own thing you know like which i respect too i think i i love to read personally um, but i also respect like all forms of access you know Mm -hmm. i also like you know fuck to know so Mm -hmm. some people study and study and study and that's great and some people are just Yes. Low, right and so this woman say her name for us again Tanya Stasilovich and she's with what organization is it Earthbound she works with Earthbound they're like a queer sci-fi wrestling um performance group they do um queer sci-fi wrestling shows and they're amazing and political astrological political like intersectional like really good and the connection as a performer for me the connection to the audience that I have is God that is divinity right there. There's nothing like that feeling. I can't recreate it. I live for it. I do so much for it. I put so much energy into honing the like experience and the relationship between myself and my audience. And I'd say it's like one of the most intoxicating experiences out there. It's uh, because there's this next level. It's so much outside of just the two. Think about voices yeah. in harmony. It's yeah. not two voices. It's like a third It's like thing, you know? interaction and collaboration and like yeah, like it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And so now we've come back around to um, how you manifest this in your performance life. I know Glam Gam deals a lot with consent as a primary theme in your shows it has been in a recent show definitely a primary consent we did greasy Mm -hmm. uh a lesbian love story it's a queer re-adaptation of uh the sh- the uh, fucking you know the Greece. John the John Travolta Greece yeah Greece yeah Greece yeah. <laughs> uh, Greece right and uh, sorry I'm so stoned but yeah I was the uh, you know John Travolta character um, Danny Danny Foucault actually yeah and uh, I was kind of like this this I'm sorry yeah it's pretty good Danny Foucault Danny Foucault okay and I was Just like Google it. <laughs> 
F O U C A U L T. U L T. Um. Yeah. And Danny Fuko is kind of like this douche bro lesbian. Um. And they, I guess, they're like pretty non-binary. I'd say. But they like in they're your in the my glam interpretation. Glam version yeah, of in, the story. We're, we're, we are no longer talking about the movie, folks. Um, in this version of the story. Yeah, they're kind of like douchey and like you know they try to use polyamory to just like be shitty and like kind of push the boundaries of you know their love interests um in our version she's called uh winter valentine because mm-hmm. we have a winter joke because montreal of course <laughs> but yeah glam Glam also does just all kinds of gender and sexuality themes and feminist themes um we're trying to be a little bit more intersectional in racial ways because at this point we're definitely not where we'd like to be but um, in terms of visual diversity visible diversity yeah visible and a structural diversity i think it needs to be a little bit but it's hard it's always hard to do and i, I won't talk about glam gam further than that but just doing intersectional theater mm-hmm. is tough in a very whitewashed community for sure where if you're dealing with it on a day to day, like what, what would make anything different? What would make theater different? Nothing. Nothing's different. It's going to be seeped into everything you do. Mm-hmm. So, as a person of color navigating the system, I'm drawn up against an entire system that doesn't invite me unless I'm exotified, and so I definitely bank on that. Mm-hmm. Like I think a lot, mm-hmm. and monetize that. Why you know you monetize whatever you can get in the capitalist world. Absolutely. Um, white liberal guilt can pay the bills. Sure, and it gives me access to white spaces and sort of financial whatever. And uh, but uh, but yeah, like glam gram is definitely not that. It's a labor of love, but it's like all of my white family and they're definitely family. Like they're there for me, but like it's just tough navigating any relationship in a white supremacist world when you just don't share the same experience. So like, just it's always going to have to be and explaining thing and like it's just tough but yeah we're definitely doing what we can to like uh, fix those stru- structural flaws for sure yeah. and i mean if you're having the conversations it's it's definitely a starting point yeah it's yeah. happening sure. <laughs> that's actually uh, a line in the a consent line in, in the play <laughs> it's a starting point you know it, i mean because we can only take anything so far, you know. We Absolutely. Have, we have the whole rest of human history to get it together, so we Absolutely. can't be in too much of a... Yeah. We have to, I guess what I'm saying is we should be in a rush to make things better, but we have to appreciate the baby steps totally. as they happen. Right? Yeah, and that things take time. I think I'm very compelled to act, and that's my magic, you know? But it's also my coping mechanism. It's like I get stressed, and then I act. I'm very impulsive. So, like, I think just sitting in stuff, <laughs> this whole, like, meditation revolution is all about sitting in stuff it is giving yourself some time time to just be and not fix and not act and just like consolidate and like understand and reflect because there's no point acting if you haven't done that work because you're going to act in flawed way and you're going to do harm sometimes listening is like as much of an action as you need to take Listening and sitting, you know? And do you, you mean not just necessarily like the very healing friendship action of listening to another person, but also just listening to yeah. the nothing or the everything? Listening to yourself, <laughs> listening, yeah, just like, yeah, part of activism, I think, is recovery and rest. Yes, self-care. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and it gives you time to like reflect which is part of it because activism is, is hard and confusing and things change quickly. Frustrating. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the language changes, you know, like, and you, I mean, you have to be confronting these issues on a daily basis. Yeah. You know? It's never going to be easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So recognizing the goddess in yourself becomes even more important. So important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, the goddess is just, like, a head to, like, my feminist values, I guess. It's representative of, like, a nurturing connection to 
books. As much as it was hard for me to connect to my mother, I think it was very hard for me to connect to the earth and to accept being a child of the earth and being like bestowed the bounties of the earth whilst living the life that I do. So there's guilt there and there's feelings of like not belonging and not having the right to access if I'm not doing the work of protecting. And so I think a lot of my connection to the earth ideas come from just listening to indigenous worldviews and indigenous cultures talk about that because they're the ones that have the connection to the earth. I'm the one who's flown. I'm a nomad and I've settled elsewhere and I've migrated much. So I'm like used to being like dispossessed in like a more choice way related to colonization. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So it's complicated. (laughs) It's complicated, but like, um, like I don't, I haven't been enslaved or like stolen, you know, or I'm forced out of my areas by settlers. Um, yeah. Being here as a settler, an immigrant settler on, um, you know, Mohawk territory and like indigenous land overall in Canada, I definitely like listen to, I, I take my, I take my, my decision making, I guess, from their experience with stewarding the land and waters. Cause I don't have that experience. I don't know this land. I don't know how to interact with it. I'm doing my best. And, um, I know that it's your question isn't necessarily specifically tied to the land, but I think it's important to specifically tie it to the land first Absolutely. and then talk about earth in general, mm-hmm. because I have less of a connection even to that concept because it's so grand. It, it's made to think to seem so grand by the capitalist white supremacist bullshit society that I live in. Oh, I could throw all the adjectives, <laughs> yeah, ableist fucking there, yeah. ageist, this all the hot yeah. pot of garbage, the yeah. toxic, let me just yes. reduce it. The toxic society that I live in tells me that it's too big and I don't have power. It's too vast. But if I'm doing what I can do in my place, listening to the people of the place that I'm in, then I can have rippling effects because that's what magic is. It's like a boosting. So if I do my thing in my small area, the whole world changes because we're all A, connected, but also macrocosm, microcosm. And also healing myself is healing my ancestors in the same way that listening to the indigenous people on how to heal this land here is the same as like healing all of the land and like creating a space for healing anywhere else because we now have the internet. So people find out and people protest and shit happens. The Arab Spring is going to be amazing because people have access to revolt and people are starting to get access to knowledge and it's happening. It's just so guarded and so protected and so privileged and like sheltered and like we just need to like keep rejuvenating ourselves and like replenishing the well of goodness and happiness and rebalancing from the inside if not from the outside like both if possible Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh, there's a a really interesting movement happening here in montreal where it's like a this um about reparations Mm-hmm. And basically, you know, young Native people who have not been given the opportunities that we have taken from them mm-hmm. <laughs> historically, mm-hmm. and they're just saying, I need help. Help me. And instead of thinking it as charity, of it as charity, or posing it as charity, they are posing it as reparations. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I, I made a donation, I was like, you yeah. know, yeah, this is absolutely, yeah, absolutely the least. Because obviously, you know, when the United States talks about slavery and reparations, it is, it is quote, maybe impossible, because how do you pay back for generations and generations and generations? But reparations in a personal, you know, individual, we can all be making reparations. Absolutely. You know, we can be reading, buying, pardon me, buying and reading books by women of color, books by native people you know don't look to the source look to the source for what you want to learn from and reparations magic reparations Mm -hmm. definitely is like a form of magic because you're keeping people alive literally (laughs) these people need that and they're asking for help and that's magic Mm -hmm. and you're like granting because we're all connected and we're like this universe that's able to give 
at different times when you can, mm -hmm. and then receive at different times yeah. when you need. Yeah. You know? And don't come in on your white supremacist high horse with your charitable thinking. No, this is reparations. This is not charity. Let's mm -hmm. say this again and contextualize it thusly in your head, listeners, please. When you're making these donations, you're not saving anybody. You are making up a debt. You are trying to pay off a debt that will never be paid off because of the, it's souls. Yeah, there's exactly. No, there's no monetary We've literally value wiped we out with. entire communities with, like, all kinds of, you know, Eurocentric diseases and disorders. Like, and it's generational and it's, like, spread and it's, it's diminished quality of life for people living today, like, People living Direct, today, directly, directly, directly related to us being on this land, and like we don't experience that. We just don't. We just don't at all. Everyone has trauma, but like we don't have this trauma. No. This is the most one. No. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could obviously talk about this all day, and we may still, but at a certain <laughs> point, um, we're gonna run out of bandwidth on our airwaves here at Missing Witches. So, um, help me wrap it up. Like, if what goddess phoenix what is the gospel according to goddess phoenix what do you want people to know about you or about you as an extension of the universe or about anything just hit me hit me with anything you haven't said already that you want to say now ah i don't know just love yourself and help each other and connect and find god and just be free and yeah yeah that's it that's all i love it thank <laughs> you so much we're gonna leave you with audrey lord a woman speaks i just returned from um from a feminist conference and book fair in london where for a week over and over again i was brought or made very very conscious of the ways in which Black women and white women do not hear each other. So yet again, this is an attempt. The title of this poem is A Woman Speaks. Moon marked and touched by sun, my magic is unwritten, but when the sea turns back, it will leave my shape behind. I seek no favor, untouched by blood, unrelenting as the curse of love, permanent as my errors or my pride. I do not mix love with pity, nor hate with scorn, and if you would know me, look into the intros of Uranus where the restless oceans pound. I do not dwell within my birth, nor my divinities, who am ageless and half-grown, and still seeking my sisters in Dahomey, witches wear me inside their coiled clothes, as our mothers did, mourning. I have been woman for a long time. Beware my smile. I am treacherous with old magic and the noon's new fury. With all your wide futures promised, I am woman and not white. Hey, witches, we're doing this podcast not to teach but to learn. So if you have a story or you have some information that will help all of us understand better what this world of magic is about, oh, my God, we want to hear from you. So please email us at missingwitches at gmail.com or share with us on Instagram. Tag us in your photos, missingwitches, or use the hashtag.